Um, good evening or good afternoon or good morning, everybody, depending on where you are. Um, it's a pleasure to have you tonight. Um, my name is Khaled Fahmi, and I'm the director of the Center of Islamic Studies here at the University of Cambridge. And um, it's a pleasure to have you all. Um, and it gives me great personal pleasure and uh, an honor to introduce uh, my colleague and friend, uh, Dr. Hossein Ahmed, um, to present um, his talk tonight. Uh, Dr. Ahmed is um, uh, assistant professor of history at the history department in the National University of Ireland, Maynooth. Um, and before he went there, he was actually a fellow here at the Center of Islamic Studies here at Cambridge. Um, and we had the pleasure of having him around with us. Um, and before that, he was, uh, he had a fellowship at Leuven University in Belgium. And before that, he had just finished his PhD dissertation from the history department at McGill University in, um, in Canada. Uh, uh, Dr. Ahmed's uh, book, uh, which is based on his PhD dissertation, just came out in uh, last June, um, called The Last Nahdawi, and sadly, I don't have a copy of it here with me in my office. Uh, but I would like to take this opportunity and put in the uh, chat the promotion, um, uh, the publisher is having a book launch promotion so you can buy the book at 30 percent of its price and i just put the con the information in the chat for anyone who wants to do so um and um uh, and today's uh, topic um, the title of it is the same title of the book with the uh, which is you can see it in front of you the last nahdawita hussein and institution building uh, in egypt Hossam, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Khaled, for the kind introduction and the kind invitation um, to come and talk to you about, about the book. It, it's great to be back uh, uh, at the center, even if, if we're doing this online. Um, and thanks to uh, Neil for, uh, for organizing the session as well. Um, it's actually the first time that I'm talking about my book. Um, there's a huge list of people that I would like to thank, but I, I, I don't think we have time for that. So I will just limit my, um, my thanks to um, Kate Wall, my, the editor-in-chief at Stanford University Press, um, also to the Taha Hossein family for the help they extended to me by allowing me to have access to Taha Hossein's private papers and lots of photographs which found their way to the book. Um, and then there are so many um, people who helped um, along the way, uh, family members, friends, mentors, um, colleagues. Um, so many people made this possible and I'm very grateful for all of them. Um, I understand that this is a public talk so I, will not assume that people, everybody knows who Tahsin was um, and how important he is in uh, modern Arab history. So I will say something about him, um, about his reception today before I move on to uh, the book and sort of try to walk you through, give you a sense of what I tried to do in this book and how I organized it to try and get that point across. So um, the last Nahdawi uh, is the story of, of culture, of statecraft, of modernity in 20th century Egypt. And I tell this story by focusing on Taha Hussein, who is one of the most iconic and controversial figures in the modern Arab world. Um, as some of you may know, as many of you might know, he is a household name in Egypt and um, the Arab world. Um, a prolific writer, a renowned literary critic with dozens of classics and hundreds of articles to his name. He is the Dean of Arabic literature. 
Let me see if this will go. Yes, perfect. Um, his autobiography, Al Ayyam, or The Days in Three Volumes, is widely considered uh, to be his masterpiece. It has been taught in many countries in the Arab world and in many introductory courses on Arabic literature and the history of the modern Middle East in Europe and North America. The Days has been constantly praised by literary critics and scholars of Arabic literature. Roger Allen, as you can see on the slide, for example, has noted how almost every commentator on the modern Arabic novel includes some reference to this work. Likewise, uh, scholar Fedwa Malti Douglas um, has remarked how Al Ayyam is both one of the foundations of modern Arabic literature and one of its most enduring monuments. Ta Hussein has also left his mark on many Arab intellectuals. Marxist critic Ghali Shukri, for example, noted after Ta Hussein's death in 1973 that there was not a single intellectual in the last four decades in the Arab world who had not been influenced by Ta Hussein. And as you might expect, references to Ta Hussein abound in public life in the Arab world. Um, you see his books everywhere in print and in increasingly online. There's a television series depicting his life. We study some of his texts at school. He's often discussed in the mainstream media. There are streets that carry his name. He's even on postage stamps. And this, as you might expect, nurtures the feeling that we know Ta Hussein, that somehow we have figured him out um, because he's in front of us so often. And as a result, everyone, everybody seems to have an opinion on Ta Hussein, which makes his reception highly predetermined, if you will. So in the region, for example, and generally speaking, um, secularists tend to idolize Ta Hussein. They see him as a symbol of an unfinished battle for freedom of thought and expression. Islamists, however, they demonize him. They accuse him of having westernized the Arab Muslim mind. And for someone who mattered so much to generations of Arabs and whose name still generates passionate, fiery debates half a century after his death, there is a curious lack of scholarly single studies of Ta Hussein in English or in French. And perhaps we can talk about this question of audience uh, during the Q&A, if you like. Even studies that deal with Ta Hussein have often been susceptible to a narrow focus on his published work and literary debates. In these studies, he usually comes across as an intellectual who idealizes sort of a pure form of art and culture, which he claimed in his own books that they should transcend politics in order to enable what he liked to describe as a genuine understanding and cooperation between peoples and nations. As a result, he has been criticized by scholars for having overlooked the impact of the unequal power relations that existed between colonizers and colonized and that undergirded all cultural exchanges between them. And for those who do not know who Ta Hussein was, this is just a bit of biographical information. Uh, he was born in 1889 in the province of Minya in the south of Egypt where he received a traditional education in the village Kutab, where he memorized the Quran by heart. He lost his eyesight at the age of two or three. This did not stop him from going to Cairo to study at the prestigious mosque University of Al-Azhar in 1902. And he was among the first to register at the new secular university, which opened its doors in 1908. He was the first to earn a doctorate degree from that university in 1914. And then he went to the Sorbonne on a scholarship um, to get his second doctorate. He returned to Egypt in 1919 with his French wife. So this is a slide with Al-Azhar. Um, the photograph comes from 1906. So around the time Ta Hussein was there. And on the left, this is one of the oldest photographs that we have of Ta Hussein in which he's wearing um, the traditional dress, as you can see. And that's going to change, obviously. And here you see Ta Hussein with his wife, Suzanne, and the kids, uh, Mu'nis and Amina, after they came back to uh, Egypt. 
And upon his return to Egypt, he began his lifelong academic career at the Egyptian University, now Cairo University. He also founded Alexandria University in 1942 and was its first president. As member and then president of the Arabic Language Academy, he attended the meetings uh, regularly until his death uh, in 1973. So a very active and prolific man. But what about the context in which Tahsin lived and worked? At the turn of the 20th century, Egypt was witnessing many changes, um, such as the introduction of a new secular university, as I said, a flourishing press, active literary salons, and intense public debates over nationalism, the role of religion, women, and education in making a modern independent nation. This is just a photograph of downtown Cairo in the 1930s. This would have been the space in which Tahsin moved very often. Um, bottom of the screen, you see uh, Tahrir Square, Ismailia Square at the time. This is Qasr Nil Street. This is Al Azbakiya and the, and the Opera House. Plenty of lectures at the time, and this is one of the lectures um, that were, was organized by two of the French speaking groups in Egypt at the time, Les Amis de la Culture Française en Egypte and the Essayist in 1932 to commemorate the centennial. Um, of uh, Goethe's death. And you can see Tahsin in the second row here wearing his traditional glasses. And I think next to him is his, his wife, um, Suzanne. And he moved very freely, freely um, in, in these different contexts. Now, these debates uh, that I mentioned, um, dealing with nationalism, religion, women and education and so on intensified as a result of the 1919 revolution in Egypt and Egypt's nominal independence from Great Britain that followed the revolution in 1922, starting what is referred to as Egypt's liberal period between 1922 and 1952. Um, a politically volatile parliamentary uh, period with a constitution, a multi-party system, uh, elections, but the British remained as an occupying power intervening at will in Egyptian domestic affairs, a situation made worse by an autocratic king and divisive partisan politics. But as a result of this nominal independence, the Egyptian government retook control of different ministries and administrations, including the country's educational system. And then Tahsin became quickly involved in debates on how to reform this educational system and the steps required to achieve a full independence. The Last Nahdawi is a social biography that takes both Tahsin and his socio-political context that I just explained to you seriously. Hussein becomes a lens through which to understand larger social and cultural transformations that took place in Egypt during this parliamentary period. But in the book, I shift the focus away from the familiar Ta Hussein, the Dean of Arabic Literature, and turn to Ta Hussein, the politician. I show that it is essential to examine his understudied career as a statesman and a bureaucrat to better understand the political and institutional constraints in which he developed his now controversial ideas, such as the universality of culture, for example, and in which he made his decisions, such as introducing pre-university free education. The book shows how Hussein developed and implemented his ideas in tandem with local political struggles and social debates. Not only as an intellectual writing in widely read journals and newspapers, but also, and as you can see on the slide, as Dean of Arts, um, as a senior civil servant in the Ministry of Public Instruction, first as controller uh, of general culture, and then as technical advisor to the Minister of Instruction. And then he became Minister of Public Instruction himself. He was also, as I said, member and then president of the Arabic Language Academy between 1940 and 1973, a very long time. 
in that way, the book tells the story of Taha Hussein as well as the society and the societal structures in which both his thought and action were embedded. And by doing that, I am in conversation with um, many scholars. Um, I will not mention all of them, but telling the story of Taha Hussein as a social actor helps release him from what Leila Dakhli has called the chain of oppositions in which Arab intellectuals have been trapped for so long. Oppositions or binaries such as secularist and religious, for example. By foregrounding the details of Taha Hussein's local context, I pay heed to the Allah Hamza's call not to use Europe and its achievements as a yardstick against which to measure contributions by Arab intellectuals and reformers. Including human details such as family, friendships, debates, and professional networks in this historical account helps me address Layla Parsons' concern that complex, intimately drawn individuals are often missing in historical accounts in our field. And as Yuav de Capua emphasizes, we need to stop portraying Arab intellectuals as, and he describes them as static signifiers of ideas, try to see them as contextualized dynamic human beings, something that storytelling can help us with. He goes on because of storytelling's capacity, and I will quote him because he says it so nicely, to embed human subjectivity into the original social context in which the subject spoke, wrote, and acted, end quote. And of course, historians um, listening to us will immediately say, um, so, so how did you do it? You know, what sources did you use? Um, to do what I wanted to do, I needed to look beyond Taha Hussein's published work. Taha Hussein did not write theoretical works in which he neatly laid out his project for educational reform, its development, or its intersection with politics. In his books, he neither described his duties as a civil servant nor documented the measures he took to develop the institutions within which he worked. So I needed a different source base. And I turned to archival documents from the Egyptian National Archives, the archives of Cairo University, the archives of the Egyptian Ministry of Education and the archives of the French Ministry of Foreign Affairs, as well as Taha Hussein's private papers, um, which I was able to study through the kind authorization of, of his family. Reading these sources closely allowed me to follow Ta Hussein in his meetings, to understand his executive responsibilities, to study the memoranda that he prepared for his different projects, and how he navigated a very complex state bureaucracy, as well as unpack the network of intellectuals, statesmen, and reformers with whom he dealt in order to implement his vision. To Translate his holistic vision from an abstract thought into coherent policies. Ta Hossein, the academic writer, turned into a clever bureaucrat, proposing feasible projects within budget, which he then had to defend in parliament. To ensure the steady operation of these institutions, Hossein, the intellectual, also functioned as an astute statesman, maneuvering a complex parliamentary system constantly undermined by an ongoing British occupation and divisive partisan politics. The, the book uses all these sources to drive a new narrative in which I reconstruct Taha Hussein's larger anti-colonial project to which he devoted most of his adult life. Taha Hussein's overall objective was to build and restructure institutions of knowledge production, like secular universities, like the Arabic Language Academy, the Ministry of Public Instruction, various technical councils, uh, such as the Supreme Council of the Universities and the Supreme Council of Education and so on, and then to disseminate this knowledge through universal free education in primary and secondary schools. In his mind, these institutions would be responsible for training scholars, funding their research, connecting them with scholars working in other countries, making the Arab Islamic tradition physically and intellectually accessible by locating and publishing critical editions of old manuscripts, as well as making classical Arabic, the vehicle to understand this tradition easier to teach and to learn. 
in that way, his sociocultural project would contribute to the development of a new national leadership and an increasingly educated, politically active modern citizenry to open the way to a versatile and open culture that would be both deeply rooted in the Arab Islamic tradition, but also fully integrated with and a contrib contributor to contemporary Western culture. In his view, this system of knowledge production was to help Egypt and Egyptians achieve intellectual parity with Europe, to vindicate the readiness for self-rule. This is in the logic of the interwar period and force the British to recognize Egyptians' ability to handle the responsibilities of a full and a proper independence. And institution building in the title of the book came from the study of these sources. And it took me months of, of close reading before I was actually finally able to say to myself that said he was an institution builder. And this is the hook. This is how I can approach his legacy the published work, the debates and actions relationally in, in relation to each other. I do not claim that this is the only way of trying to make sense of Ta Hussein's overall extended legacy, but I claim it is a way that works. What he tried to do was more than the sum total of his published works. So how is the book organized and structured. I start with the story of an unknown conflict um, between Ta Hussein and France, despite his very well-known cultural and family ties to that nation. Um, as Minister of Public Instruction between 1950 and 1952, Ta Hussein created institutes and chairs of Arabic and Islamic studies in Spain, in France, in Greece, in order, as he said, to situate Egypt as the guardian of Arabic and Islamic studies in Europe and around the Mediterranean. The conflict with the French started when he tried to create schools and an institute for Arabic and Islamic studies in French-controlled North Africa. The chapter shows that despite Hussein's own controversial claim that culture should always transcend politics, the details of his negotiations with the French reveal that for him, the cultural was always in fact political and constituted the cornerstone of his anti-colonial project, focusing more on action than some kind of flowery pan-Arab rhetoric. The chapter sets the stage for the rest of the book because I wanted to defamiliarize the reader with Ta Hussein, the same way I was um, encountering a different Ta Hussein in my sources. And this is a photograph uh, taken um, in 1951. Ta Hussein went to inaugurate the Muhammad Ali Al Kabir Chair for Arabic and Islamic Studies. Um, in the Institut d'études Méditerranéennes in Nice, in France. And to his left is his son, uh, Moutnes. So this is the first um, chapter. Then I have a chapter on the private Egyptian university, which was, as I said, created in 1908 and which became a state university in 1925 when the private initiative failed. I use the history of the private Egyptian university as the first higher institution dedicated to the study of the humanities to establish a link between Ta Hussein's project and the Arab Nahda, this famous period of intense intellectual debates on uh, reform and state modernization in the 19th and 20th centuries. I show that the founders of the university internalized one of the Arab Nahda's central tenets which was to promote cultural reform as the means of resisting the European colonial project, a cultural reform that they prescribed as a critical engagement with the classical Arab Islamic thought while integrating new ideas and research methodologies coming from Europe. I therefore call the private university an Ahdawi institution. And throughout the book, I show how Tahsin remained consistently faithful to this guiding Nahdawi formula, the old and the new, in all his reform efforts. For Ta'a it was no longer sufficient for intellectuals 
to write in journals and to discuss in salons with proper, well-funded institutions like the Faculty of Arts, like the Arabic Language Academy, were required, were needed to extend and deepen the Nahda project. Interestingly, you know, those who will read that chapter, you know, you see the university founders and Taha Hussein dealing with very familiar and topical questions like, why are the humanities important? How can, how can we attract students to the humanities when more lucrative careers could be found elsewhere? Who should fund the humanities? And this is one of the famous photographs of the inauguration of the Egyptian university in 1908. And then I come to the third chapter of the book, which in a way is the heart of the book, in which um, I turn to the Egyptian University's Faculty of Arts, which Ta Hussein saw as the driver of the Nahda, as the cornerstone of Egyptian democratic life. In his view, the university was to provide intellectual leaders capable of diagnosing the country's problems and proposing adequate solutions. They were the ones to design the national curriculum necessary to create modern citizens conscious of their rights and responsibilities. This knowledge would then be disseminated through primary education, which Ta Hussein made free in 1944, when he was technical advisor to the Minister of Public Instruction and in secondary education, which he made free in 1950 when he became minister himself. And I will stop for a second to give you an example here of why it's important to put these decisions that Tahsin made in their parliamentary context. The documents show that Ta Hussein's career in the Ministry of Public Instruction gave him what you can call a bird's eye view of school admissions. He had read the applications of children of poor parents who were turned away because they found the tuition fees prohibitive or because of a lack of classrooms. In 1942, he wrote about thousands of rejected scholarship applications each year. He then used these figures to illustrate the need to grant more scholarships, slowly building a case for a free primary education, which was then successfully implemented in 1944. He mobilized these figures, he mobilized these st statistics to say explicitly, and I quote, Al Shab Yuridu An Yata'allam, the people want to be educated. As he continued to campaign for free secondary education in the 1940s, he positioned the Weft Party, the party with which he was affiliated, as the party that listened to people's demands. And when the Weft won the elections in 1950, Taha had his voters full support when he defended the project and its budget before parliament. Putting Taha Hussein's de decisions in their parliamentary context shows us that unlike earlier Nahdawis, he was not simply saying the intellectual class must educate the other classes. The powerful imagery that he deployed in that campaign and which we learn at school, like what you see on the slide, you know, the famous statement, education is an absolute necessity like water and air. This was part of the campaign um, because in parliamentary Egypt, voters mattered and he needed to convince them of his project so he could implement it. To say that Tahsin imposed free education from above would be too simplistic. This third chapter also shows that Tahsin was conscious of the shortcomings of Egypt's volatile multi-party system and his executive decisions document the concrete steps that he took to ensure the the proper and stable operation of these institutions. The archival documents reveal that his solution was in the form of what he called technical councils. These were elect bodies that were to sit between the ministry and the different institutions um, as a kind of buffer. Uh, in that way, the technocrats would be shielded from the rapid turnover of political power, which was very characteristic of this period, helping these technocrats decide and coordinate amongst themselves 
on the best short and long-term policies for their institutions. Hence the Supreme Council of the Universities, restructuring the Supreme Council of Education and so on. And finally, I address the importance Tahsin gave to the state in his project. This was a huge project, as you might imagine, involving higher education, funding missions abroad, supporting research agendas, primary and secondary schooling, an active language academy, teacher training, publications, and so on. In, the, in his view, this required a stable and dedicated support from the state, which he saw as the ultimate force of modernity. While doing that, he explicitly asked Egyptians to rethink their relationship with their modern state. He implored them to see the state as there to serve them. The state is there to respond to their demands. And then I also analyze in the chapter how he implicitly predicated the success of the entire project on the existence of a multi-party system with its different checks and balances, a free press involving the public in various debates, a turnover of political power, transparency in budget allocation, and a strong parliament holding governments accountable at all times. And this is a photograph of the university in the early 1950s and on the right you have the Faculty of Arts where Tahsin's office was. In the fourth chapter, I look at the role Tahasin played as member and then president of the Arabic Language Academy in trying to diversify authority over classical Arabic and breaking what he believed was Al-Azhar's monopoly over it. For Tahasin, classical Arabic was at the heart of his reform project. He saw it as the means to create the desired continuity between past, present, and future, while ensuring stronger communication among all Arabs. The chapter opens up a period of intense debates about the challenges facing the classical tongue in modern times and how Tahsin fiercely resisted calls to impose the colloquial or Latinize the alphabet following the Turkish example. In line with his project focusing on modern institutions and informed by his duties as an educator, marking language exams at the secondary level and teaching students at the university level, he believed that together with the Faculty of Arts, the Arabic Language Academy, which I also refer to as another Nahdawi institution, was better prepared than Al-Azhar to meet the dire ch challenges facing the language. While respecting all the old rules governing the correct usage of the language, Academy members were to find new ways to make the eloquent language, as Tahsin always called the Arabic language, more accessible and more relevant to the youth. In this chapter, I therefore discuss serious efforts done at the academy to derive new terms, push for simplifying grammar rules and inserting these rules organically into engaging literary texts, creating modern dictionaries and so on. In that way, I argue that Hussein's disagreement with Al-Azhar was primarily over giving scholars from the university and the language academy the right to engage critically with the Arab Islamic tradition and make classical Arabic more accessible. He did not seek to exclude Al-Azhar from his reforms, but he believed that the religious establishment's monopoly of the tradition and the language had to be challenged. And this is one of the last photographs that we have of the Hussein. This is near the end of his life and his health had deteriorated, but he insisted on attending all the academy meetings, even when he had to be carried into a, into inside and out of the building. And you can see his wife, uh, Suzanne, next to him. She, she went to the meetings with him. Finally, I look at Taha Hussein's marginalization in the 1950s and the 1960s. Initially, he had welcomed the officers coup in 1952, um, he was actually the first to refer to that coup as a revolution. And he even attributed the success of the coup to the culture and education he and others had been disseminating for decades. For him, it was his revolution. 
But the book shows how state authoritarianism and public anger against the intervention of colonial powers in Egyptian and Arab affairs made it impossible for Ta Hussein to continue promoting his project of natural synthesis between what he liked to call the old and the new. And this is a photograph of Nasser decorating Ta Hussein in 1959. By the time Tahsin died in 1973, he had tragically witnessed the undermining of the two institutions that had been the pillars of his reform project, the parliament and the university. And the next is a photograph that I really liked taken by his great granddaughter, Maha, and she was very kind to share it with me. And I use it in the book, but in black and white, not in color. And this is Ta Hussein's grave. And on the left, you see a mimosa planted by his wife, uh, Suzanne. To summarize and to conclude, um, by examining Ta Hussein's actions against the backdrop of his complex relationship with the Egyptian state, the religious establishment and the French government, the book argues that it becomes difficult to dismiss him and his generation as uncritical intellectuals infatuated by a superior European culture, as some scholars have argued. The Las Nahdawi explores an Arab Muslim experience of modernity in which historical actors like Ta Hussein and his generation of intellectuals and policymakers, they faced the challenge of the West with self-confidence and believed that embracing what they saw as the new the secular university, new kinds of knowledge, new teaching and research methods, new kinds of social practices did not mean giving up or diminishing their own traditions and literary heritage, but was rather a natural continuation of that heritage. Nonetheless, the book neither tries to redeem Ta Hussein and his generation nor claims that they did everything right. Rather, it's an attempt to understand them in their own context and not through the lens of all that has come since. As political events since Nasser's time made their project of natural synthesis impossible, history was rewritten in Egypt itself in a way that lumped these intellectuals together on one side or the other, for example, modernist or traditionalist. And Ta Sin remains a prime example of an intellectual who is trapped in these binaries, which overlook the context in which he wrote and the bureaucratic and institutional constraints in which he made his decisions whether he's being recalled by Islamists who demonize him or by others who worship him. During the parliamentary period, Hussein was not only an intellectual, but also a politician and a statesman. It's therefore essential that we consider his career in the civil service, consider his political life in order to produce new contextually rich readings of his published work. While taking the many challenges and frustrations of the parliamentary period into account, the last Nahdawi unpacks the structural changes and political processes of this period, necessary to understand the large strides that were made in culture and education, despite all of these frustrations. Such accomplishments include quadrupling the number of universities and opening them to Egyptian women, increasing the number of students sixfold, introducing free education through a democratic debate, of which Ta Hussein was exceptionally Proud, describing it to Arab delegations gathered in Alexandria in 1950 as a triumphant Egyptian experiment that he hoped would benefit other Arab countries in the common fight for freedom and independence. As early as the late 1930s, Hussein attributed Egypt's modern awakening, as he called it, to the Faculty of Arts, to its scholars, and to the knowledge that it produced. These achievements force us not to dismiss Egypt's parliamentary experiment as a failure, as many scholars have tended to do. As an important precedent, these successes challenge an enduring colonial trope, which has become a tenacious post-colonial claim that Egyptians are unfit for active participation in deciding and running their own affairs. And as a complex, serious attempt to rethink the contract between Egyptians and their modern state, the parliamentary period is an important precursor to 2011 one that merits further analysis on its own terms. In my introduction to the book, I describe, it as, I describe the book as the story of the life and death of an alternative Egyptian history, the story of what modern Egypt could have become 
whether we agree or disagree with Taha Hussein's vision for what modern Egypt should have become or should become, the questions to which his project tried to respond are still pertinent. These questions are still pertinent, I think, because he grounded his project in people's daily lives, their expectations and their demands. Demands that sound eerily familiar and which we continue to hear in different parts of the Arab world. Demands for freedom, justice, and human dignity. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hossein. Um, yeah, that's a wonderful presentation. Um, the floor is open for questions, and I think the best way is to pose your question in the chat, or, I mean, it's difficult to see your hands because there's so many icons. Um, so I think if you can either just write that you have a question um, and in, in the chat, or just say, I have a question or pose the question itself in, uh, in the chat. Um, and then, um, and then I will uh, then either read the question if it is stated or ask you to pose it yourself by, un by unmuting uh, your mic. Um, so, um, so while I'm waiting for questions, um, Maybe I can pose the first question, Hossein. Um, and uh, it, if you can tell us a bit more about the sources, the kind of source archival material that you have found, where you have found them, um, and any particular difficulties that you encountered in reading them, if you can just share with us something um, uh, about uh, about the the sources, and um, and why why have these sources not been used before, or have they been used before by people working? with uh, on town scene. So something about the sources. And then I'm now starting to see some names. So I'm taking down the names in the order in which they have been uh, raised, the questions. That... So let's start with a response by you. And please feel free to jot your questions or raise your hands and I'll be checking the screen as Hossam is answering. Uh, thank you, thank you, Khaled, and thank you to those who um, um, uh, are writing in the in the chat window uh, the words of encouragement. Thank you very much. Um, so yes, I mean the sources were um, an exciting part of the project, but also a very daunting exercise. Um, I knew that very little had been written on Taha Hussein's career. And I thought this would be a good, a new fresh angle from which we can look at his, at his legacy. So instinctively, I sort of thought, okay, this would have to be in the Egyptian National Archives because they have all the state records. Um, but I think as, as most researchers know, when you apply, you don't know exactly what you're applying for, and you're not told exactly what databases to look for. Um, so I had to explain very roughly what I was going to do, and certain databases were suggested to me, and slowly I started to understand that what I needed to focus on um, was the Council of Ministers, uh, because that's where all these projects end up going. That's where, when he writes a, mem a memorandum, he knows that's where it's going to go. He needs to discuss that. If he is on, on the council, he needs to explain it to his colleagues. Um, 
when he was technical advisor, he would write the memo that then, for example, Nagib al-Hilali as, as Minister of Public Instruction would then take to the Council of Ministers. So I knew this is where I would, I should start. Um, and there are two databases for the, for the as, as I discovered later on. Um, and I was able to get access to, to what I needed. And the beauty about these, these memoranda is that they explain the history of any project. Um, you notice, for example, that they spend a lot of time if they're doing something for the first time. So if they want to increase the scholarships by a tiny figure, like 1%, then they write this huge memo explaining why they think it's useful. But once it has been approved, they will submit another memo that refers to the first memo, but the second memo is very short and it could be five to 10% because the precedent has been set. Um, Cairo University was extremely helpful because they have um, Taha Hussein's file and um, that includes all the responsibilities that he had to do as, as a professor, as, as dean, um, correspondence between him and the ministry, requests, for example, asking him to write textbooks or uh, to appoint people to supervise Arabic language exams. Um, I went to Dar al-Mahfuzat al umumiyah as well, which have a f obviously Tahsin's um, uh, pension file. Um, Again, a list of his duties, his um, uh, promotions, um, those kinds of things. The, the French archives um, were extremely useful because they gave me a, an extra angle from which to look at Tahsin's executive responsibilities. So, I wanted to base those responsibilities from, I wanted to rely on the Egyptian archives to reconstruct what he was trying to do. But I also was interested, okay, so now that he was doing this, what kind of response did those kinds of projects um, lead, let's say on the French side? And the French, they, they keep lots of records on their relationship, cultural relationship with Egypt. Um, and of course, they were very happy when Tahsin became minister, but then he started causing all kinds of trouble. And you can see the disarray and the, and the panic that he caused in very high um, circles, uh, decision-making circles in French-controlled North Africa and France itself, because when French North Africa, the different director generals could not agree on where to host the institute, this had to be escalated to the French Council of Ministers. Um, he knew how to play the game. He understood the language. Um, um, so it was, you know, a way for me to follow the impact of what he was trying to do from a, from a, from a different, from a French perspective. And then you have the private papers, um, which again, you know, I, I, I approached the family very, very politely and, you know, they were extremely generous and they answered all my questions. And then, you know, they gave me the private papers as well. Um, which you know they, they show you reports uh, that he wrote uh, drafts of memos uh, correspondences um, it, even if i didn't use all of it it, it still gives you a, a closer understanding of, of of who he was outside of the of the published work uh, which was also important to look at obviously to work with and against it in a way but i wanted to focus more on the politician and and the statesman Thank you very much. Um, I, um, I will then now go through the list of the questions in the order in which they were posed. And I'll ask Farida, uh, Farida Ma'ar to ask the first question. But before she does so, Hossein, if you're not going to use the slides, maybe you can ah. stop the yes. screen share. OK, thanks. Um, so um, uh, ask Farida first and then yes, Suleiman. Thank you, Khaled, and thank you, Hossein, for this fantastic presentation. Um, I'm very interested in whether or not uh, you found any references in Ta Hossein's work 
on progressive education and on an interest in child-centered learning activities. I know that in his book, Mustaqbal al-Saqafa fi Misr, he, you know, he's against uh, centralized um, examinations. He's uh, for critical thinking. But I was wondering if you um, had come across any of his influences when it comes to his pedagogical uh, interests and his philosophy, when it, um, his, his pedagogical philosophy. Thank you. Uh, I think, thank you, Farida, for the question, um, which is a great question, um, but it did not figure much in the official sort of state documents that I, I looked at. What I know of, of, of his thoughts and ideas, they come from certain reports that he addressed, let's say, to the, the Minister of Public Instruction, dealing with, for example, the language question, um, in which you can find like, uh, so he's, he's, for example, he is totally demoralized by the level of command of classical Arabic that he sees in um, uh, the secondary level uh, and the exams that he, has to, that he has to mark. And so he writes a report to the Minister of Public Instruction and then he says something like, you know, exams are a necessary evil. Um, um, but I, I did not come across anything substantial in which he said, you know, this is sort of a, a thorough discussion on, um, on, on the topic that, that you are interested in. Um, he would, for example, again, when it comes to language, he would propose, uh, he will discuss, for example, how grammar rules students find them extremely complicated. And he's trying to find methods by which to make them more accessible. Um, he is, for example, uh, trying to simplify the way the, the language is written. So, you know, al harakat how to include that in the actual text. Um, you know, and he has this very interesting thing when he says, we should read to understand, uh, not to understand so that we can read which is basically what we do when we scan a sentence to understand where the different parts fit and then we know how to pronounce uh, correctly. Um, but I, I, I haven't come across, I think I know what you mean, but I haven't come across uh, anything substantial like that. Sorry. Um, uh, Professor Yasser uh, Suleiman uh, has his hand up and it's a pleasure to see him. Professor Yasser is the founding uh, director of the center that I am now uh, directing. So it's a pleasure to see you, Yasser. Um, please go ahead. No, un unmute, uh, please unmute. Thank you, Khaled, and thank you, Hassan, for this very interesting talk. Um, I just have one or two queries that I would welcome some clarification on. The, the first one, I think if I understand you correctly, you began by saying that something like Ta Hussein was an intellectual who idolized art and culture and wanted them to be uh, separated from politics, not to be subject to uh, political um, fluctuations. But then in chapter one, in your talk about chapter one, you talked about the Hussein thinking that culture was supremely political. So how could art and literature be separated from politics when they are part of culture and culture is supremely political? So that is number one. Number two, which I'm really interested in, is that in your talk about uh, Ta Hussein, you always described him as an Arab intellectual. And I, I don't really know Ta Hussein as much as you do, but I've done some work on him. And to me, he comes across until 1952 as, as very much uh, in political terms and state identity terms, very much as an Egyptian uh, intellectual first and then Arab and maybe Muslim intellectual second. So to what extent can we build 
your narrative around this category of an Arab intellectual. Because Ta Hussein struggled after 1952 to find a way of negotiating rapproch rapprochement with the emerging Arab, pan Arab nationalist movement. Right. Um, so these are my two queries, and I would really welcome some clarification on those just to set my mind on the right path of thinking about the Hussein. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Suleiman, um, for, the, for the great questions. Um, so, I mean, you, you, you're absolutely right, and I agree with you that um, I, I cannot separate art slash culture from politics. But what, I'm, what I was saying in the chapter is um, a response to certain scholars who say that in his thought, he idolized uh, art and culture as a kind of a, um, a separate artistic sphere that has little to do with politics. Um, I, I, I refer in particular to um, the seduction of uh, translation by Shadon Tegeldin. Um, and, you know, the, the coda of the book is focused on a debate that Ta Hussein has with uh, Al Aqad on translation, um, in which he describes translation as um, the need to translate as something universal. Um, and he gives examples in which the colonizers actually used the culture of the, of the colonized and translated from that culture, uh, giving example of the Romans and the Greeks, um, the Arabs and the Persians and so on. And Shadon Tegeldin takes an issue with Tahsein on this because she says by un universalizing the wish to translate, he is taking translation out of its um, power dynamic that exists between the colonizers and the colonized. Um, and in that way, she accuses him of, of sort of not being critical enough of the politics surrounding the translation process. Um, and by extension, the whole Nahda project in her, in her view, which is uh, obviously a, a, a project of translation. And also this idea comes across in the famous uh, debate on Iltizam, um, which again, I, I deal with at the end of the, of the book. Um, and, you know, he was per portrayed as somebody who defended art for art's sake. Um, he, he said that he wasn't doing that. He said that he was not writing for uh, the elite as, as he was accused of, of doing. Um, but it kind of stuck that he was somebody who refused committed literature. He refused um, to politicize literature as a vehicle for decolonization. Um, and it is still assumed by many uh, that, you know, he was somebody who defended art for art's sake. But what I show in the first chapter is that, as you, as you, as you pointed out, everything for Tahsin was political. Um, and his negotiations with the French show the extent to which he understood the impact of culture's politics. Um, the impact of education and what it could do on a political level. And I include, because basically at some point, because he wants to build all these institutes, um, he's pushing hard against the French and the French are not happy with what he's doing. And then a colleague, a minister, basically tells him, why are you antagonizing the French? Why don't you let go of these institutes? And Tahsin says, although he has been telling the French all along that these institutes are only for cultural reasons, they have nothing to do with politics, they have nothing to do with nationalism, they will not be used to turn um, the North Africans against you. But in his letter of resignation, he comes out and says very explicitly that the reason for building these institutes is, is to resist colonialism. Um, to resist the French language policies in, in North Africa. So I actually totally agree with you that he, um, 
he d he did he did not uh, think of art or culture as as unpolitical uh, at all. Um, and then about the second question, um, Taha Hussein's Arabness, I think what struck me as I as I looked at all these documents and you know how he how his ideas can be linked to what he was trying to do. He comes across as a very intellectually honest um, person, and he would not talk about a, a project if he did not think it was feasible. So, you know, the debates around, you know, um, Egypt, uh, Egypt's pharaonism and the, the debates that he had in the 1930s uh, about pan-Arabism, his, his, his conversations and debates around this topic, in my mind, they come out of this obsession with how are you going to do it? How are you going to implement um, any of these uh, ideas and suggestions that are, are being circulated? Um, he could not, he accepted the nation state. He accepted that this had to happen within um, you know, the boundaries of a nation state like Egypt. But at the same time, he always made it clear that the heritage or the Torah that he talks, talks about is an Arab Islamic one. Um, when he talks when in his many of his debates and meetings in the Arabic Language Academy, he is obsessed with the idea that uh, there's a lot of talk about bringing Arabs together, but there's no action that was done to make the classical language um, taught in a way that would actually bring those Arabs together. He was very concerned about the use of the colloquial, and he kind of predicted that a, a, a point will come when Egyptians will write and the Iraqis will not understand what they're saying. And and vice versa. And if you look, you know, on Facebook pages, it is happening. You see those debates carrying on in, in, in the colloquial, and it's very hard to follow if you're not from Iraq or from Egypt and so on. Um, so he was very strategic about what needs to be done. And he even comes out and says, if we are really concerned about pan-Arabism, then we need to then the Arabic Language Academy and the different governments need to work together to get um, the learning of the language, to make the, the, the teaching and the learning of the language easier, to make classical Arabic more accessible. And then in his mind, I suppose, uh, we can talk about a, a kind of political form of pan-Arabism. Of pan um, but I, again, I agree with you that he saw himself as an Egyptian nationalist. But the, the, the culture that he talked about is, is an Arab Islamic culture. Yeah, Hussein, um, we have um, more than 10 questions. So I'd like to okay, ask you be to give everybody a chance to ask, and they're all intriguing questions, to try and, uh, and be quick. So in order not to waste time, the, second, the next question is by Iman and Nushu'aki. Thank you so much for your uh, for this excellent presentation. Wondering if there are any plans or, or ongoing projects to translate the book into Arabic. Uh, thank you, Iman, for the for the words of praise and for the interest in the book. And yes, ev eventually that is what I would love to to see happen. But as you might expect, it the logistics are a, a bit complicated. Um, also, time is—I uh, I don't know if if if, if, you, if you're teaching, but you know, time is a is a a rare commodity when you're teaching. So I, I need to be careful how I, I do this, who I you know will cooperate with. Uh, think of a of a you know a publishing house. Um, there's a lot to think about, but yes, it's 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 on it's on the agenda for sure. In fact, you know, and, we, and I mentioned the question of audience before, I, I wrote the book, obviously, with an eye on the Western Academy, because this is coming out of the Western Academy, but I was writing the book, thinking of, um, you know, people and debates and so on in Egypt and the Arab world, so um, it, it will happen. <laughs>
I can I can assure you. Thank you. Okay, the next question is from Elizabeth Kasseb. Um, if you could mention one or, or two moves he undertook in Parliament that drew your attention or surprised you, that sheds a new light on the Ta Hussein we think we know. Um, thank you, thank you, Susanna. Thank you for, for coming. Um, that's a great question. And I think I have actually two of these. The first one is his defense of the budget when he was about to make secondary education free. And we, we don't talk enough about his blindness, but he was apparently repeating numbers and figures for more than three hours from obviously his memory. Uh, to try and convince Parliament that the project was actually feasible. Um, and the second is perhaps less flattering. Um, an, an MP asked him to explain what bureaucracy means, what democracy means, um, and Tahsin gave him the, the Arabic translation. And then, um, Basically, the MP, I think, was trying to be clever. Um, but Tahsin could get very impatient. And then uh, the MP says something like, um, should we not use the Arabic equivalents of these terms instead of using demokratia and, and so on? And Tahsin, I believe, was perhaps in a bad mood or did not like the MP, which is quite possible. And he just told him, the honorable MP will not lecture me on the capabilities of the, of the, of the Arabic language. And that stopped the, the debate. Um, so yeah, he could, I think he could be quite impatient as well, but incredible memory, obviously. Um, the next question is by Merav Rosenfeld. Fantastic presentation, thank you. Two questions, if possible, uh, please tell us a bit more about his influence on the Arab world in general and Iraq in particular. And secondly, his impact on minority groups in the Middle East in general and on Jewish intellectuals in particular. Um, that's a big topic. Thank you, Miral. Um, so Iraq uh, and the minorities, yes and the Arab world in general. Um, maybe I can say something about the, again, from an institutional perspective. So at the time, the Egyptian university was seconding professors to go to Iraq and uh, work in Iraq. And as Dean of Arts, he was very annoyed that he was losing his staff. Um, um, and the staff that went to Iraq uh, were obviously, you know, instrumental in, 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 in building universities in Iraq as well. But Tahsin did not, you know, he also acted as someone in charge of a department and he did not want his to lose his 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 staff um, I am not aware of I mean I did not follow exactly like uh, his a particular reception for him in in Iraq I was I was trying to focus more on institutions and what struck me was this this close cooperation between the Egyptian University and what was happening in Iraq at the time of trying to build um, higher education as well. In terms of minorities, um, one of the things that stand out again, and, and perhaps it, it, it indicates something about how, how well he understood the bureaucracy was when a Jewish student wanted to go and study at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. Um, and the rules at the time said that missions had to go to the West, to, to Europe. And the student went to Tahsin asking for permission to go to 
Jerusalem. And what Tahsin did was say, well, Palestine is now under the rule of the mandate and that puts it under the British. And so he was able to find the loophole in, 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 the, in the rules in order to send the student study where, where the student wanted to study. And he did this all the time. Duriya Shafiq, for example, she, she, she wanted to study philosophy, but she was not allowed to because she was a woman. And again, he found that she wrote to him and he found a way for her to do what she wanted. And the classical case is Suhir al-Qalamawi, who couldn't get into the Faculty of Science. And again, he found a loophole in the admission rules and she was admitted into his faculty, the Faculty of Arts. Um, and then of course, the, the owners of al katab al-Misri, they were a well-known, um, was a well-known Jewish family, the, the Harari family. Um, I don't know if that answers the question, but yes, obviously there was a lot um, uh, involved there. Amr Sharawi asks, uh, why do you think Ta Hussein is the last Nadawi? Um, that's a Great question. Um, I mean, the title was um, something that Will Handy and I discussed, um, and it caught my attention. Um, in a way, it's provocative because you know, you know, is the Nahda over or not? You know, that that I suppose that's the question that you're you're hinting at. But the way out for me to keep the title, I I found it in an interview that he gave to uh, Rali Shukri a few months before he died. And Rali Shukri is asking him, okay, you know, you've done so much, you and generation, you have done so much for um, resisting colonialism before 1952. What role do you see yourself and your generation doing now? This is the early 1970s. And Tahsin gets very upset about the question, um, you know, and he tells him, you know, we try to, um, get rid of, of the British occupation. We tried, uh, Salama Musa tried to establish socialism and so on. Have you done any of that to say that our roles are over? Uh, and then who are you talking about? All of them have died and I am the last one. Um, and I'm, you know, putting my papers away and I will be gone soon, something like that. So I, I used that to say, you know, that, you know, he was the last one. But this was, to me, Tahsin is an example of somebody who had a, a very elaborate project. And it wasn't just an intellectual vision. This was somebody who actually worked, he worked very hard to implement this vision. Um, and I don't know if we have had a project of that size, of that magnitude since. Um, so in a way, that was the original discussion about why he was the last Nadawi. Thank you, Amr. Uh, El Sayyid Al Sahimi is um, asking, uh, thanks for the interesting presentation. Methodologically speaking, I wonder if you could tell us more about why, uh, about what you mean by social biography, by focusing on persons, political and private lives. Um, right, thank you, um, Sayyid. So the, the, um, the idea of a social biography is not to focus only on Tahsin, that's not what the book is about, but to use Tahsin as a way of opening up a certain moment, which is the parliamentary period. Um, the social biography looks at a, an individual because as an approach, an individual is, is capable of telling us a lot about a certain moment. Um, um, options available to that person, uh, their response, the way they maneuver these options, uh, the networks that we could unpack by following one person, the way I did with his meetings. I mean, the meetings allowed me to see how the civil service, the bureaucracy, how it worked, how from an idea, how can you actually implement um, a project? What, what, what process is involved? And I was able to do that by following him and his projects. Um, when I say 
you know, I, I, I include details about, you know, his family and friendships and professional networks and so on. This is done, I mean, that's a very good question because at some point you ask, okay, do I need to include this detail or not? And in where I thought it was not helping what the chapter was doing, I did not include the details, although there were some, you know, fascinating personal details, but that was not really what I wanted to do. But at the same time, I wanted to, you know, you know, do what you have the Capua is, is, is asking us to do, which is to rehumanize those intellectuals like the Hussein. Um, so I, I was, that was, that was in my mind. And so I used what allowed me to try and insert him back in a social context so that his ideas, even the published ones would make more sense. Um, but for a social biography, it is this interplay between an individual and their context that, that is the, the power of it. It's not just the individual. Thank you. Paul uh, Anderson, uh, our colleague here is asking, uh, uh, thanks for the wonderful talk. I wonder how far the role of allies, whether personal or professional is significant or how far they shaped or enabled the reform institution building project. Uh, thank you, Paul. Um, Another great question, and you know, Tahsin. Again, when we look at the context, it allows us exactly to address that question, which is, you know, how he managed to do what he what he did, and he did rely on a network of uh, supporters, and perhaps his ally in in most of these uh, battles was Mustafa Mahas, the the head of the Weft Party. They were friends as well, and they saw eye to eye. So when, for example, Nahas signed the 1936 treaty, Tahsin cheered it. And when he abrogated the treaty in 1951, again, Tahsin uh, supported his decision fully. Um, Mustafa Nahas, so Tahsin was not actually member of the WEFT. And when Al Nahas asked him to become minister, of public instruction. Initially, Tahsin said no, because I'm not member. But then Al Nahas insisted that he join the ministry. And this is what enabled him to make secondary education free. Um, so he had supporters. Um, um, Mustafa Abdelrez and Ali Abdelreza, for example, they were supporters. And he relied on Ali Abdelrez and his you know, discussion of, of the form of rule that, that Muslims should have. Uh, for him, that was sort of discussed, decided, and done, and he moved on from that. Um, but then you have also per people who were against this project, and he responded to these people. Uh, the famous one, obviously, is Ismail al-Qabbani, who was against free education. We, we're taught at school that Tahsin is sort of this good guy who wants to make education free, and Qabbani is this sort of villain who thinks it should be an elitist um, endeavor. But when you go deep into the detail, it was actually a very sophisticated debate. Um, and Qabbani had very reasonable arguments about the dangers of a, f a rollout of free education. And Tahsin was responding to that. And that's what, that's what made the debate so um, interesting because to appeal to the voters, Tahsin had to respond to the critiques of Ismail Qabbani. And while doing that, he started to infuse all these ideas about democracy and what, what should the state do? If the people want education, who are we to say that they don't deserve it? Um, and when free education was introduced and he was talking to these Arab delegations in Alexandria in 1950, he actually steps back from the debate. And he says that those who were against free education were doing what they thought was best for Egypt as well. Um, so in a way it was this debate between them that, I, I think I say this in the book that the Egyptian public learned more about democracy from having this debate on free education than they might have um, learned it from, let's say, a book by Jean-Jacques Rousseau or anybody else. This was a, 
um, a live exercise in what that actually means, that these decisions will affect them, will affect their children, will affect the, their futures. And this would not have happened without, without this debate between Tahsin and, and his nemesis in, in, the, in that debate. So yes, there were many people who were for the projects and people who were against the project. Um, and Tahsin dealt with, with, with all of them. And this, I think, again, to, to respond to uh, Said's question, it, it is part of the, the strength of the approach. It allows you to see, you know, Tahsin navigating these networks of support, but also the networks which uh, were, against, were against his projects. Thanks. Uh, I hope everybody doesn't mind the fact that I'm reading the questions. I think it may be quicker. I mean, since you jotted them down, so I'm, I'm just reading them. Um, the next question is uh, Talat Farag. Uh, thanks, Hossam, for the enlightening talk. Isn't it strange that we still repeat the old binarist, secularist versus traditionalist arguments about Hossein? Isn't it strange that some scholars need to defend Hossein against silly accusations? Why don't we have Hossein's works as textbooks in pre-university education? Just wondering. Um, I, I think I think it's 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 a, it's a, it's a very valid critique, and in in many ways, we have to deal with the fact that this is still how we classify our intellectuals. And the question is how to do it. Um, in the case of Tahsin, this is a, a very, this is somebody who was so active in, in the civil service, in public life. And as a result, he has left a lot of archival material that we can check. And then that helps us render the complexity of the choices that he faced and the compromises that he had to make. Um, he wasn't just, you know, thinking abstract ideas, but he wanted to implement those ideas. And this for Tahsin was, at least in, in how I approached it, was a good way to address what you say, the, the, um, those binaries. Um, we, I'm not focusing on Tahsin's ideas. In fact, I think some people might know some of his ideas better than I do, because I, I wasn't really um that was not the focus that's not what i wanted to get into what i wanted to get into was a way of looking at this extensive legacy including his actions um in a way that made sense um the the goal is that if you if you read the book and then you reread one of tahsin's works that you will read it in a different way because you see how it fits in a sort of a, a bigger project, um, which I think is what he tried to do. Um, but I think it depends on which intellectual we're talking about. If it is somebody and we, what we have by that person is only his published work, then I, I, I'm not sure. We will need to think how to try and get that person out of those binaries. But in, in Tahsin's case, he left a wealth of documents, a wealth of records that helped me, I hope, um, um, talk about him as a, as a social actor, as I said, as Leila Dakhli says, and not just about his ideas, uh, not see him as some kind of um, a signifier for a certain kind of secularism. So even, even when I discussed the Arabic language and what he did with the language, if you, if you check what he was trying to do, you cannot really just dismiss it and simplify it and say, oh, he, la he lived in France and he tried to impose this sort of French la laicite on, on, on how the language was run. Such an argument would not hold because he was having very serious conversations with Sheikh Al Maraghi of Al Azhar, for example. This idea of creating a, a historical uh, dictionary for the language. Um, he did not try to exclude Al Azhar or Dar al Ulum from these discussions, on the contrary. But you can only find that in the minutes of meetings of the Arabic Language Academy. Uh, this is not something that he talked. In fact, if you just read The Future of Culture in Egypt and what he says about Al Azhar and Dar al Ulum, in that book, you would think, you know, 
you would have a certain idea, but then when you see the, the work, the action, um, it, it challenges, it complements the published work um, in, in more interesting ways, I find. But there's a lot, a lot to do. Thank you. Um, Samir Saad is asking a question about Tahsin's relationship with Mustafa Nahas. Uh, it says, your book makes it clear that they, Nahas and Hussein, had a close relationship. Was this more political or personal? What was Hussein's position on those figures who split from the left and formed the Saadist party in 1937-38? Um, my understanding is that they were actually close friends. So Nahas, for example, was invited to uh, Ta Hussein's uh, daughter's wedding. Um, there are photographs show that show that they were actually very close. Um, and he talked about Mustafa Nahas in, 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 in very, very positive uh, terms, um, which was not the case with Saad Zaghloul at all, for example. Um, I think what Tahsin did was try to keep himself, I mean, if you are referring, let's say, to al Kutl al Wafdiya and uh, the Black Book, and I think Tahsin tried to keep himself from these, I would say, scandals sometimes. Uh, he understood what the partisan politics were doing, and he Again, like exams, he thought this was a necessary evil. He had to be involved in politics to get his projects done, but he did not join the WEFT as a member. Um, um, and later on, Nasser will criticize, or Nasser, you know, written by Haeckel, he, he, he criticizes the period between the two revolutions and dismisses all the partisan or the, or the parties as corrupt. And Tahsin agrees that there was a lot of corruption but he refuses to dismiss the accomplishments in culture and education that took place in that period. Um, but he tried to keep himself, he keep, keep some distance from these partisan politics if, if possible. Um, and for example, he was, you know, he did not go to Mahkamat al-Ghadr, for example, after the, he was, he, although he was, he was a member of, of government. Um, so, yeah, thanks. Okay, Hossein, in the limited time we have, let me uh, read, we have like three or four questions. So I'll go, I'm going to read them together. Okay. Uh, so that you know where they are and you, you, you choose how you want to handle them. Um, so only three or four questions, but because we're running out of time. So the first is by uh, Qasim al-Saraiha. In your opinion, in what aspects Hussein was different than other Nahdawis? And then Bil the uh, Trabal is asking, what intersections, if any, did Hussein's work in one or another Nahdawi institution, for example, the critical manuscript edit, editing and public publication committees he, he uh, headed, have with his work in other Nahdawi institutions like secondary and higher education? Do we find excerpts from these critically edited works in school primers, high school or college readers? Um, and then um, Elizabeth uh, Kaseb is asking a follow-up question. Um, all the best, Hossein. What are you working on now? Um, and uh, if I were to ask a last question, do uh, um, you think his um, bet on the state was well placed or do you think uh, the state, the Egyptian state in particular, um, has actually stifled intellectual production? Um, during the, the, the parliamentary period or afterwards, you mean? whatever, given the long span um, and given that he had the time to reflect. Right. Um, okay, thank you all for the, for the great questions. I'll, I'll try to be brief. Um, so for Qasim's question about his difference from the Nahdawis, 
what's what stood out for me is this obsession with institutions the obsession with building a um institutions that are stable that are well funded that pay attention to adab uh, the humanities um in a way that is sustainable that that we could rely on and which eventually will meet the objective set by the earlier Nahdawis, which is this idea of a cultural reform that is deeply rooted in the Arab Islamic tradition, but also open to new influences and knowing how to process these, these influences. Um, and by association or by extension, and this is why his vision in my mind is, is is very large. He doesn't focus on what the university should do or what the ministry should do, but he looks at all of these institutions and how they should work together and how they should be run together. And this is why he gets involved in politics. He understands that these institutions, which need, which get their money, their funding from the state, the Minister of Public Instruction is head of all these institutions, the university, the Arabic language academy, hence the idea of building technical councils to give members of these institutions the freedom to do what they want and the freedom to decide what's best for their institutions. This kind of vision, which he then implements, to me sets him up apart from the earlier Nahdawis. Um, to have this idea that, okay, who is going to come up with a national curriculum? Who is going to uh, think of problems uh, and then offer a diagnosis for these problems. Um, how is this going to be rolled out? But, and the, hence the idea of free education. When we say Tahsin, we, we associate him immediately with free education, but free education is just a part of this whole, this, this bigger whole. And so, you know, for me, this is what distinguishes Tahsin from, from the earlier Nadawis, but still guided from the beginning until the very end by this idea of the old and the new. And if you've seen the TV, the famous TV interview that he had with all the important um, writers at the time in the 60s, Sibai, uh, Anis Mansour, Nagib Mahfouz, and all of them, you still find him criticizing these intellectuals for not engaging enough with the old and the new. So you know, he wants them to be firmly rooted in, 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 the, in the tradition, but also reading English literature in English and French literature in French and, and so on. Um, the second question about how his, I suppose, kind of inter-institutional um, relationship in terms of texts, to be honest, I have not looked enough at texts. But what I can tell you is that what I noticed is that people who criticize Tahsin the less happen to be people working on the pre-modern period and people working on the language. They seem to have seen enough of his work at the academy or you know, in publishing these manuscripts um, that they all the, all, the, all the other accusations, you know, that he was, you know, a westernized, secularist, uh, uncritical, infatuated, those kinds of, 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 of accusations usually do not come from people who um, work with these old manuscripts or work with the language. Um, I assume because they, they see the extent to which he was in control of um, his, 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 he could find his way in the Torah in, 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 in a, I, I sometimes feel jealous that, you know, he, you know, all kinds of intertextualities, uh, you, you could not mess with him because he knew what to say. He knew what text you were referring to and he could get, get back at that because he understood where you come from. Um, I know this does not answer the question, but I have not seen texts in which you see um, work that he did in one place 
appearing in one another. Maybe Farida actually might might have seen some of these. Um, I don't know, but thank you. And uh, finally, um, about what I'm working on, um, I ended up starting to work on Mohammed Hassan in Hegel, actually. Um, um, I am fascinated by how Al-Ahram sort of becomes the public opinion maker in Egypt and in much of the Arab world, replacing the academy. Um, in a way, it, 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 it's, it's, it's becoming more and more apparent to me that if somebody stands out from that period who has such a strong influence, then it is Muhammad Hassan in Hegel in a very different way, um, in a way that Tahsin would not have liked or approved of um, at all. And it is indicative that he did not join the sixth floor uh, of Al-Ahram like many other intellectuals and writers when he was asked to uh, by Muhammad Hassan in Hegel. So there's something there going on between, between Tahsin and Muhammad Hassan in Hegel that I'm curious about. Okay, well, um, uh, thank you so much, Hossam, uh, for a fascinating presentation and uh, congratulations on the book. Um, thank you. I very much look forward to seeing it in Arabic somehow, sometime soon, I hope. Um, those of you who, are, um, who joined late, let me just remind you that there is a, a promotion on buying the book that you will see in the very first item in the chat function. Uh, the publisher has uh, graciously uh, given a 30% discount on those who buy the book and there's a code that you can use. Um, and it just remains to me to ask everybody to join me in uh, thanking and uh, applauding Hossein for a wonderful book and congratulating him for the book. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me and thank you all for coming, for joining. Thank you. <laughs>